Hi there trailer owners, today on your 2020 Grand Design Momentum, we're going to be taking a look at and showing you how to install Kodiak's Electric Over Hydraulic Disc Brake Conversion Kit. In this kit you're going to get all the parts you need for one axle, you'll get rotors for each side, calipers for each side, and these calipers do come loaded with the pads, as well as the caliper bracket to get it mounted up. This will take your old drum assembly that used to be here, you remove the assembly and the new components will install right in its place. The rotor is designed to accept bearings inside of it, so I do recommend replacing the bearings when you put these on, as the races do come pre-installed in our rotor, which is nice for us, it's one of the hardest parts of swapping out a rotor or drum assembly where you got to put the, the bearings in is driving those races in and out, so that part's done for you. The Bearing kits are available here at eTrailer, so you can get a kit for a tandem or triple axle trailer, depending on how many axles you have. And you can buy as many of these kits as you need as well to get as many for your trailer. Going from drum brakes to electric over hydraulic disc brakes is going to drastically decrease your stopping distance. Disc brakes have more surface area to grab than your drum brakes do, and these operate at a significantly higher pressure than what your drum brakes do and that just means overall you've got more stopping power. One of the other benefits you get over your regular electric brakes that have drums is with these disc brakes here and an electric over hydraulic setup, it applies the caliper using hydraulic fluid. So when the actuator starts to apply and it goes to squeeze, it's very similar to how it works on your vehicle that you're driving your regular truck. This is gonna be a smoother brake operation than what an electric brake is. Electric brakes is pretty much instant. Once that current's there, the magnet grabs and it hits. This is gonna give you a gradual application that just feels smooth. And it's still a rapid application, even though I say gradual, it's gradual in comparison with how fast a drum is. So that little bit of slightly slower movement really makes a big difference in how it feels when you go to stop. It's not nearly as abrupt. The rotor that comes in the kit is a 13 inch rotor. It's designed for trailers with wheels 16 inches and larger. It has an eight on six and a half bolt pattern with half inch diameter studs. Now this conversion kit is just for your axles here. We already discussed how you will need bearings and also you'll need seals. Those typically come with your bearing kit if you buy those. If you don't buy a kit, you can't get the seals by themselves here at eTrailer. But some other components that you will need is hydraulic lines because we do need an actuator to send brake fluid back to our caliper to apply it. You can get line kits here at eTrailer. We do have tandem and triple axle kits available so you can get whatever you need for the size of your trailer. Those line kits do come with everything you need to get these installed. You'll get all your lines that'll go from your actuator at the front, route to the back, as well as all the fittings that are necessary to make all the connections. And you also get flexible brake hoses so you can go from those lines down to your caliper here while still maintaining proper suspension travel that won't cause any damage to our brake components. This flexible line here can move up and down nice and easy. Here's our actuator here at the front. We're using one from Hydrostar. This actuator is designed for use with disc brakes and it puts out a pressure up to 1600 PSI. And it, you do need to have that higher pressure with these disc brakes, so I do recommend an actuator just like this one. This actuator has four wires on it. You've got your power ground as well as your brake signal and your breakaway switch wire, so you've got all the wires you need here. You can often use your breakaway switch on your trailer, but I do recommend upgrading it, especially if you've got an older trailer. You wanna test the operation of that breakaway switch, and it's a fairly cheap item, and you wanna make sure that that's working. Just in the event you do have a catastrophic disconnect, that breakaway switch is what's going to activate your braking system to help your trailer come to a safe stop. Now that we've covered some of the features of our disc brake kit, why don't you follow along with us, and we'll show you how to get it installed. We'll begin our installation by parking our trailer on level ground, getting it lifted in the air, and getting the wheels removed. Now you can do this at home in your driveway. Now this is a pretty long trailer, so hopefully you've got some nice flat ground that's nice and sturdy you can get it supported on. You want to make sure you lift it by the frame. You can use your hydraulic jack to do so. And then use jack stands to support it. You'll need to get it lifted up high enough to where your wheels are off the ground. Once you've got it lifted and supported, we're using lifts for ours. You can go ahead and remove your wheels and then just set those aside. Now if you don't have a high, if you don't have an impact at home, before you lift your vehicle, you may want to take each of the lug nuts and just crack those loose with a breaker bar. You don't want to take them all the way off, just crack them loose because they can be difficult to remove once it's lifted because uh, your wheels are going to want to rotate on you. So now that we've got our wheels out of the way, now we can get into the meat of getting our old brakes off and getting our new ones on. We'll start by removing the cap here on the end. That's going to expose the nut 
that's going to allow this to come off. I'm just using a rubber mallet. A dead blow also works pretty good. And we're just going to kind of hit the cap. I like to kind of hit it somewhat outward in a way, just a little bit. Saw it moved a little bit, kind of rotate it, give it another tap, and it, it'll eventually pop off there. Usually it takes a couple more hits than that, but we got pretty lucky. We'll set this one down. Here inside we've got our grease pack bearings, but we need to get the hardware out of the way first. It's holding it together. It's a little hard to see here, but there is a small clip that holds the nut in place, and I'm getting my needle nose, or you could use a flat blade screwdriver, kind of behind the clip, and I'm just kind of scraping my uh, tool along the face of the nut there until it gets the lip there, goes in, and then I'll just grab it. I'll just kind of work it and pull it off of there. We are gonna clean up all this hardware, get rid of all that old grease, uh, as we're gonna be putting new grease on. If you know the type of grease that was on here, you can use the same grease. I do still recommend just cleaning it all up though, get all that out of there. You don't want to mix greases though, so if you're unsure what kind of grease you had, it's best if you clean it all up and just replace it so that way you don't mix the types of greases. Because certain greases can interact with others and cause them to break down and lose some of their lubrication properties. We can now remove the nut. I like to use channel locks for this. Spread them open and we can just grab it. These aren't on here very tight and that's how it's supposed to be. When we go to install our new parts, you'll see that we're not gonna be tightening this down very tight. So we're just gonna remove that guy and then we're gonna set it down as well. You might notice below I put a napkin down below the work area there, to help minimize the mess. There's a lot of grease here, so it's good to have a little bit of something to help minimize how much grease you're gonna get over, because this will stain carpet and everything else, so you don't wanna step in this. It's best to keep it, uh, keep it clean. So now to remove our whole hub, we're kind of at that point now. Once that nuts off, this whole thing will slide off. We're just gonna start it first though, because our outer bearing's right there, and it'll just fall out of there. So I'm just gonna start it. There we go, just a little start. And then before we take it all the way out, I'm gonna take my screwdriver and I'm just gonna poke it at the end of the spindle there. We'll then kind of rock it a little bit and we'll get that bearing to fall out of there. It'll fall onto our screwdriver and we can set it down onto our clean mat down there. And now the whole unit just slides off. We'll set it down. And that's basically it for this. We're not gonna be rebuilding any of this. We're gonna be replacing it with our new parts. So we're done with that. We'll turn our focus back up here to the spindle. We're gonna go ahead and get all that grease off of there. So just get all the old grease out of the way. And then once we've got that off, we'll be removing the backing plate with all of our old brake hardware there. You'll see that there's several nuts around the back side. We're gonna remove each one, but I like to get the grease out of the way first again, just to minimize this mess. This can really be a messy job if you don't take the time to clean it up and keep things a little organized. So we're gonna use a 15 millimeter socket to remove each of these nuts. Just zip them off of there. Once we get these removed, there's a couple of wires on the back side. We're gonna cut those as well. You can cut those first. I like to remove the nuts first just because this thing I know it's not going to fall off of here. These hubs, oftentimes you got to give them a little love tap just to get them to break loose because of the rust and stuff that's on there. So we're going to head around to the back side now. We'll grab our cutters. So here we have the wires that are connected to our brakes. This particular one's coming out of the axle. If you were on the other side of your trailer, it'd likely just be coming down from the underside of the trailer down to the brakes. We're going to cut the wire. I like to leave enough excess here to where if the customer ever needed these again, he still can make a connection, although these are pretty much gonna be useless because we're putting a better system on. But it's there just in case. So we'll just move this aside. We've got our wires disconnected now so we can remove the whole brake unit. So just kind of give it a little tap. That'll break it loose. And then we can slide it off of there. And we're just gonna set this aside. I like to turn it over because it'll actually slide right into the drum. That'll help minimize the mess that you gotta clean up. We'll now open up our new kit and get our parts out and we can start putting some stuff on. So here we got our kit opened up. We'll show you what parts you're gonna get with it. The kit does come with two sets so you can do a complete axle. When you open up the box for one side, you're gonna get your rotor. It's got your races pre-installed for you there so we can just pack our bearings and drop them in. Comes with your bracket. This is gonna replace the whole assembly that we just removed with our shoes on it. And we've got our caliper which is gonna bolt to the bracket. The pads come pre-installed in the caliper so we can just slide that on and bolt it on. We do need a few additional parts though in order to put this together because while we've got all this new brake hardware here, we need bearings to be able to put it on. 
I do not recommend taking your bearings out of your hub and putting them in here. The, these ones here, there's a specific bearing they're designed to take and they have the races pre-installed. You wanna make sure you're using new bearings because if you try to use any old hardware, the races and the bearings they wear to match each other. And once they've worn in, if you try to put that bearing into another race, it's the wear that has already occurred there. It's just gonna cause a lot of premature wear and it's gonna wear out before you would want it to and you have to do more costly repairs. So make sure you put a new bearing in here. We're, we have a kit that we actually are gonna use here that's a triple axle kit. You're gonna receive enough bearings to do all three axles. So you'll receive your outer bearing here. You'll get six of those and you'll get six of your inner bearings. We need the bearings, inner and outer here. We're gonna be putting those in in just a minute. And we also need the grease seal for the back. You can pick up this kit here at e-trailer, so it's got all your bearings and your seals. Other things you also get in this kit that we're not gonna be using today is you do get new caps, but we're not gonna be using the new caps because they are closed. So we're gonna be retaining our factory ones since those have the little rubber opening here so we can use the easy lube feature that our trailer has still. You also get new lug nuts that are the correct size to go on the studs here. Since our customer has aluminum wheels, we're not gonna be using these. We're gonna be using the factory lug nuts so that way we don't cause any issues with corrosion with the aluminum. So we'll set those aside and we'll start packing our bearings. You can get a bearing packer here at e-trailer. I highly recommend it because it's gonna save you a lot of mess. It saves you a bunch of time and it really does save you a lot of grease too. Because the traditional ways you put grease on your hand, you grab your bearing, and you pack that grease in and work it around until you've got it all the way packed in there. Waste a lot of grease, makes a big old mess, and some people are irritated by wheel bearing grease. I haven't had an issue, but if you do have sensitive skin, you might want to consider wearing gloves when packing your bearings. A bearing packer here is going to make it way faster, way easier, and with no mess. You might also notice the grease that we're using. We're going to be using marine grease here. It's a, it's a better grease than the traditional red wheel bearing grease that was on there before. This is just going to ensure extra protection in case our customer goes into areas where there's potential chance he's going to be going through higher water areas or a lot of salt. So we're going to take our bearing now. We're going to take the tapered end with the smaller diameter facing down, drop it into the bearing packer. We'll take the top. It presses down on top and you just kind of work it in there. You really just need to push down, but I like to kind of rock it around in this motion here. It seems to help it go a little bit faster getting that grease fed in there. And we want to focus our attention here while we're packing the bearings, looking at the opening between the cage and the inner race. As we push it in there, we're going to see grease to start work its way between those rollers. And we're not done packing this bearing until we've got grease all the way through all of those rollers. And you can see it squeezing through there. Make sure it does it all the way around. And then I like to just give a little bit of a rotation if you can to the bearing, just to help move some of that grease around the outside and inside, get it through there. And our bearing is now ready to be dropped in to our hub. So we're just gonna grab our bearing here. I uh, use the screwdriver again, help minimize mess. We're gonna drop that guy down in there. Try to keep the grease off the floor if you can. And then we'll grab our grease seal. And this is gonna go right in the back. This is the outside of our seal, the little lip here. This always goes towards the inside where you've got an opening and you can see the spring. You don't wanna be able to see the spring. So we'll set that there. Now there's a couple of different ways you can drive your grease seal in. You could use a seal driver or a two x four also works pretty good. One of the issues with this particular brake kit though, with the two x four method, which has been around for a long time and it's a great method, is that this kit does need to be driven in, the seal needs to be driven in beyond flush. Normally your grease seals just drive in until they're flush. So we're just gonna tap this seal in, making sure we tap it in evenly all the way around. If we look at this one down in there, we're just about in. We can see that there's a small uh, bevel cutout in there and this seal's actually not all the way in until it's flushed down with that bottom of that, of that small bevel. So you can use a seal driver kit or you could find something, get creative and find something that's a relative size of your seal and just finish tapping it in. I prefer to use a metal hammer with a seal driver. And again, we're just gonna check to make sure we drive it in even. Just checking all the way around. 
and I just like to feel the lip. That's kind of what we're looking for right there, how it's all the way down. We might be up just a little bit on this side, so I'll, I'll tap this side down just a little bit more, but this side looks like what we're looking for. So now we're gonna go ahead and pack our outer bearing. We'll set that guy on there, and it's just like we did with the inner bearing. It's exactly the same. Your outer is just a smaller bearing. So it does make it a little harder to see when you're packing it in there. So you might need to pull the, the little pack plunger off just to check the progress of how far the grease is pushed through. So now we're just gonna clean up the old hardware that we're gonna be reusing. So we're gonna take our nut, get that old grease off of there. You don't need to get 100% of it off, just kind of the bulk of it off of there is fine. So we got that guy cleaned. We'll clean up our cage. And then something that I didn't point out, when we took our outer bearing out, on the back side of the outer bearing, almost every time, this washer here is gonna to stick to the back side of that outer bearing. You have to reuse the washer, so make sure you slide that off the back of there and get the grease off of it we will be reusing this. The washer almost always has a notch in it there because it only can go on a certain way. So we've got our new parts prepared. We can now start assembling them. We're gonna start with the bracket. That's gonna slip over the spindle here and it's gonna line up with the studs that are on our flange there. You'll see we've got a bunch of slots here. There are a few different orientations that this can be installed in and it's based on your axles. We've got 7,000 pound axles, so we're gonna be putting ours facing towards the rear of our trailer. It's gonna slide on like that. Then we're just gonna use the hardware that we had previously removed to reattach it. So just zip these guys on there. We'll be using the same socket that we used to remove it to tighten it back down as well as torquing it to the specs outlined in our instructions. We can now slide our prepared rotor assembly into place. When you're sliding this guy on, be careful of the grease seal that you installed. We don't want to nick it on the spindle. So just kind of carefully line it up, get it down to the end. And once you get towards the back there, you are gonna get some resistance where the inner race of the inner bearing slides over the spindle. Make sure you get that guy all the way up on there, pushed on just like that. We'll then take our outer bearing that we had greased. We're gonna get this guy into place. Set that guy on there. Take your washer, that flat spot's gonna, has to line up with the right location, so line that up, push it in, and then you can reinstall the nut. Now this nut here, when we took it off, it was really loose. We kinda want it to be somewhat loose at the end. This is gonna adjust out the amount of play that we have in our bearings. Ideally, we wanna eliminate so there's no play, but it is better to have just a minuscule amount of play than having it too tight. So the way that I like to set it up, I'll grab my channel locks here and I'll start tightening the nut back down. And then now that I've got it pretty much run down, what I like to do is spin the rotor while cranking it all the way down. Get a nice little snugness to it there. And you're gonna feel that the rotor gets tighter. So that's kind of where we want to stop. We've got it nice and snug. We're not going to back it back off. This is just going to ensure that everything is fully seated. Back it all the way off until it's loose again. Now that it's loose, we're just going to take it, twist it until, just until we feel just a little bit of resistance, just like that. And that's where we're going to stop. In most cases, this sets you up perfectly to have it to where there's minuscule to no play. And we know it's not going to be over tightened because we, we don't really have any pressure on it. We've just gone up till it stopped. We use that initial first pressure to seat everything down. Now we'll put our cage on. This is where you might have to make just a minuscule amount of slight neat tightening it or loosening it to get this on because it doesn't always line up. It's got a flat spot there. So that's just like your washer. And typically the way these work is these two little prongs either line up with flat spots on the nut or they'll have one of the corners going between the two. 
and you saw the nut did tighten just slightly when I clicked that on there, the cage tightened it just a little bit, and that's okay. The little tiny bit that it moved it is perfectly fine. It's not gonna cause this to be over tightened. And you can even feel it when you turn it now versus when you had fully tightened it down. This feels very smooth. First, when we were cranking it to get everything seated, you, could, you felt it was quite tight. So here we've got our caliper. The first thing you wanna do is the bolts do need to be slid in or else you won't be able to get the top bolt in due to the um, leaf spring being in the way. Another thing that I found that causes issues when getting these guys on though, before we slide that in, if we look at the slides here, where the slide slides in the rubber, it's sticking out just a little bit. And that usually hits on the brake flange and makes us a real hard time getting these calipers on. So if you just push that piece in there, just enough until it's kind of flush with the rubber, that makes all the difference and getting these calipers installed. That little tiny bit there is usually one of the things that hangs this thing up. So now that we've got those pushed in, we then can take our bolts, slide those back through, and we're gonna kind of be pulling them out to where they're not, again, we don't want things protruding out of there because it hangs this up. We'll then rotate it over, lining up the flat spots on our caliper with the flat spots on our bracket there. It'll slide into place, and then we can just tighten our bolts right into the bracket. And then we can snug those down with a 13 millimeter socket or wrench. For your top one, you're likely gonna have to use a wrench or a crow's foot. A ratcheting wrench works very well. And your bottom one, you should be able to get, get on it with just about anything without a problem. Make sure you get them both started before you tighten them down. Otherwise, you're likely gonna have an issue getting the other bolts to go in. We can then go back and torque our hardware to the specifications found in our instructions. Now for that top bolt, you will likely need to use a crow's foot. Just take your time with it. Crow's feet aren't fun to work with, but sometimes they're your only option. Now we can go back and using the easy lube fittings on the end, We'll pump up our bearing here full of grease. And we wanna pump this until we see the grease to start to come back at us here. You can see that ring where we had packed it in our bearing packer on the outer bearing here. As you're pumping this, eventually you're gonna see some to squirt towards you coming from that same location, just like where the bearing packer was. As soon as we see that to start to move, that's kind of where we wanna stop because we know that it's completely filled up in the cavity behind that and it's starting to push the grease out. And you can see the grease coming out right there. That's pretty much where we want to stop, right about there. We don't want to fill up this outside with a bunch of grease and make it a big old mess. There's plenty of grease in our bearing and behind that's going to keep everything well lubricated. We'll just take our cap now. We're going to drive it back on. If you wanted to use the new caps, you could. But again, this one's got the rubber fitting for the easy lube, so prefer to keep this. And this just taps into place. If you're using a rubber mallet or a dead blow, you can just tap on the face like this. If you're using a metal hammer, then I would recommend using a screwdriver around the outer lip here, kind of as like a punch to tap it around. So now we've got it tapped all the way in. We can repeat the same procedures over on the other side of our axle and then repeat it for as many times as we need to until our trailer is complete. Once you've got all of your brakes installed on all of your axles, you need to get hydraulic lines now run to them so that way we can get pressure back here and also get an actuator mounted up. We've mounted our actuator at the front. We've brought some lines back. The flexible line here is what you want to use to connect from your lines coming from your actuator to your caliper. This will ensure that the axle can freely move up and down if you're going over bumps and things like that. We got plenty of suspension travel and this is designed to be able to move without causing any damage to any components. These hard lines, if they were to be flexed, even if it was just a little bit, over time, they would start to wear and break. If you've ever taken a spoon and bent it back and forth, you kind of can see how that would play out. So we'll take our uh, brake hose here. We're gonna go ahead and thread it up top into the fitting coming from our actuator. And then the other end of our hose is gonna thread right into the fitting here at the back of our caliper. It's important when you're putting these on that you make sure that you're not gonna stretch your hose too far. So that's why we have our suspension completely hanging. We can see we've got plenty of length. We're not gonna overstretch the hose to where it's gonna get damaged. And you also just wanna make sure it's not gonna be in the location of anything that's moving 
um, like your suspension components, like your, if you were too close to the equalizers here, it could potentially get tr crushed. So that's why we try to stay pretty much straight up. And this keeps our hose kind of back away from everything. And as the suspension goes up, it's gonna to wanna to kind of flex this way, pushing our hose towards the center of our trailer. That's gonna help keep it out of harm's way. So now we can go back and tighten down our lines. When we tighten down our lines, we want to make sure that we use a line wrench. This here is a line wrench. It's going to ensure that you don't strip out your lines due to the metal here is usually made of a softer metal. The softer metal ensures that when you tighten it down that it can compress together and give us a nice tight seal. Because this is going to be under some pretty high pressures for our brakes here. So you can see how that line here, this line wrench wraps around a little bit further, which allows you to slip over a line but you get more surface area than you would with a traditional wrench like this one here. This one here is a pretty good uh, candidate to strip out your fittings, causing you to have to start all over again and be pretty upset with yourself. So we'll slide this on here, just like this. We're gonna be using the 3 8 size for the line. You can also take a 9 16 wrench here just to hold your flexible line. This is just going to help keep it from twisting because we don't want our line to be all twisted. That's going to change the path that it's going to want to flex when the suspension travels. And we want to be, able, we want to be in control of everything that we're doing. Oh, snug that down. You do have to snug these pretty tight. But we're going to go ahead and stop right there. That's pretty snug. Once we bleed the brakes, we'll check for leaks. And if we do have a little bit of seepage from here, we'll put some more on it because it's not uncommon to have to tighten these down where you think, boy, I'm really going pretty tight here. And sometimes that's necessary to prevent the leaks. But we'll stop there and we'll go tighten up the other end. Once we finish bleeding, we'll come back and check for leaks. And if we have to put a little bit more on them, we will. So now that we've got everything installed, our brakes, our lines, and our actuator, everything's wired up and ready. We just need to get some fluid in the system, bleed it out, and then our system's ready to apply, and we can stop our trailer. So we're going to start by removing our cap. I've already topped the fluid up. You want to leave your cap off when you're bleeding the brakes. The rubber seal in here can actually get sucked, and it potentially could damage the seal if it's on while you got on. So we don't want to pull that seal out, so we'll just leave it off. We'll just set it down over here. And now we're going to have an assistant up here at the front that's going to monitor the fluid level. If you drain the fluid down too low and it drains it dry, you'll have to start the bleed procedure all over again because it sucked air into the system from the very beginning here. Your assistant's also going to top it up, make sure it stays full. And it's, it's nice if they're up here at the front because they can pull your breakaway switch pin for you to activate the brakes when you're bleeding them. We're not going to head back to the brakes, to our bleeder screws, and we'll show you how to open and close those and get this blood out. So now we are over here back at our driver's side rear wheel. Since our actuator is installed slightly on the passenger side, this is the furthest from our actuator. That's where I recommend starting because that's going to be the most distance. You're going to get the most fluid through your lines and get the most air out starting here. We've gone ahead and made just a little apparatus here to catch our fluid. You can't just put a bucket down here, but this is going to shoot out of here at pretty high pressure. So we don't want, we want to avoid getting brake fluid all over all of our components. It's pretty, uh, deteriorating for paint and stuff like that. It knocks paint off um, pretty rapidly. So the hose just wraps around. We are using a clear hose so we can monitor the fluid as it comes out. And we just got to catch down here it goes into. The bleeder screw on our calipers where we're going to be taking the fluid from. But you might notice there's two bleeder screws. You don't want to use the bottom one. Make sure you're on the top bleeder screw. So now that we're all prepped and ready, we're using a 5 16 wrench here to crack this open. I'm going to go ahead and yell at the assistant to start the actuator. Go ahead, Joe. He's gone ahead and he's gone ahead and activated it, and you can see the fluid coming out. We're going to go ahead and close it because the fluid coming out is nice and solid. There's no bubbles in there. That's exactly what we're looking for. If there's bubbles coming out, that means you need to continue bleeding until there are no more bubbles. So now we've got this one done to where there were no bubbles shooting out of our hose. There, we're going to move on to the next break and just go one at a time until we've got them all bled. I recommend, again, starting at the furthest from the actuator and slowly working your way to the closest to the actuator to get the, the air bled out as fast as possible. And that completes our installation of Kodiak's Electric Over Hydraulic Disc Brake Conversion Kit.